you'll never look at fasting the same way ever again. As a matter of fact, it'll get more powerful for you. You will probably be able to get more fat loss out of it. You'll probably be able to get your insulin levels where you want them. You might be able to manage insulin resistance better. But most importantly, you'll have an understanding of why it's so important and how we should structure it in a very specific way. Not a specific way that's overly complicated, but a specific way that's important and easy to implement. So in this video, we'll talk about new emerging science with the mitochondria. We'll talk about some new emerging science with fasting. Then we'll move into specific things that you can do to optimize your fasted state based on the newer research. And finally, we'll talk about a new strategy or really kind of an old strategy that you can implement that'll maximize and put all of this stuff together for you. Something that might be helpful, a lot of times people have a lot of supplements that they're managing, whether they're fasting or not, and it can get kind of confusing. It's really hard to navigate what supplements are good, what supplements aren't good. There's a company out there called Supco that really does a lot of work in terms of managing supplements. And check this out. So I work with them and I created my own supplement protocol, my own stack. So this particular one is like a muscle building stack. So this one shows the different things that I use, like beta alanine, like TMG, like creatine monohydrate. And it allows you to kind of tack on to whatever I'm doing. So you can follow my protocols. Makes it really cool. And you can try that app completely for free. So that link is down below. It's sup.co slash Thomas. So Subco, again, it's like a supplement management app, but they also help you shop for supplements in terms of being able to find which ones have the most clinical data, which ones have the highest quality. They test, third-party test, independently lots of supplements. So you get lots of information about making sure you get the right stuff. So check out my protocols and Subco down below. So it all comes down to the mitochondria. When we are fasting, most of us know by now that we are trying to benefit the mitochondria. But what people haven't known up until recently is that how we've been fasting or how we've been reducing calories in general hasn't been really focused on optimizing the mitochondria the way that we should. You see, for the longest time, we thought it was all about caloric restriction. Everyone was saying fasting is beneficial because of caloric restriction. Fasting is beneficial because you're allowing the body to tap into fuel sources. And that stuff is true. But what we're learning now with the new energy side of things is fascinating. We used to think the mitochondria was all about just processing energy. We take food in, it turns it into electrons. Those electrons go through the mitochondria and ultimately create energy. But what we've learned recently is that there is a level of quantum energy, quantum mechanics that's involved in it. This sounds completely wild, but it changes the entire way you look at fasting. So in 2022, it was presented at scientific reports that the mitochondria is doing something different than just creating energy. They realized that the mitochondria is actually teleporting protons from one side of the mitochondria to the other, essentially creating this gradient that allows energy to form. And a quick little like background on mitochondria and how it actually produces ATP and energy in the first place and why this is relevant to fasting. Your mitochondria is like a battery. It has a positive charge, a negative charge, and that gradient between those charges is what allows a proton, sounds crazy, to move through this little flywheel in the middle of a mitochondria. And that flywheel spins at a ridiculously high speed and creates energy. It's like a turbine, okay? So we have millions and millions of little turbines inside our body. That's what's insane, right? These turbines are responsible for making energy. But what this newer science is showing is that the rate of speed at which the protons move through is quite impossible by mechanical standards. They move so fast that the only explanation, which is now backed up with some science, is that they quantum tunnel. They move through at a quantum level, meaning they're essentially teleporting. This is next level stuff. But why is this so important for fasting? Because when we're fasting, we are encouraging our bodies to create more mitochondria. So now that we're learning that mitochondria are batteries and not just factories, it makes all the more sense why we would want to fast, why we want to go periods of time without food. When we go periods of time without food, our body upregulates something that's called PGC1A. PGC1A causes mitochondrial biogenesis. This causes the mitochondria to become denser. There's more mitochondria in a square inch per se. So you have more mitochondria, more batteries, more cells that are harnessing quantum energy. I know I sound crazy and the science sounds crazy, but if you look at the mitochondria in general, it's crazy, right? The reason that this is so important 
is that over 90% of people in the United States have a dysfunctional mitochondria or dysfunctional metabolism to some degree. It's not that this mitochondria is just what's processing our fuel. What's making this unique is that the mitochondria is actually completely core to energy within our body. It can sense information from other cells and our brain and our muscles. It emits information and light that communicates with other mitochondria and cells. So when we're talking about fasting being beneficial for the metabolism, we're talking about fasting being beneficial for creating more and stronger and higher quality mitochondria. So this is at a core, core level important. And it underscores the fact that calories may not be the most important thing. And caloric restriction as a result of fasting might not be the main benefit. Sure, you restrict calories, you probably lose weight as a result of it. But what we're learning now is that nutrient density could be playing an even bigger role. Why is that? Because what this evidence is showing is that we don't just process food and have calories that make energy magically. Those electrons that come from calories and food certainly drive a lot of the energy, right? We need that for electrons to do their job. But the efficiency at which we move protons is really what's giving us the lion's share of the energy. The electrons are just the catalyst. So is this complicated yet? Is it going over your head? It might be because it did for me at first too. The main takeaway that we need to get out of this though is that when we fast, we are optimizing our mitochondria to become more efficient. So this gives us more energy. This restores metabolic function from a signaling perspective. Our mitochondria can then signal better, can receive signals better, and everything starts to kind of fall back together. But there's another really important element that happens with fasting specifically, and that is metabolic water, where we turn fat cells into water. How does that actually work? Well, this isn't crazy. This is actually real. Okay, When you break down a fat cell, when you break down a triglyceride, you're breaking it down into usable components, right? Hormone-sensitive lipase breaks it down into fatty acids and a glycerol molecule. Those get further broken down into acetyl coenzyme A. Those go into the Krebs cycle and ultimately get turned into electrons. Those electrons go through the mitochondria. But then when they go through the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, the last thing that those electrons are accepted by is oxygen. So now you have electrons and protons, which are hydrogen, reacting with oxygen. What does hydrogen and oxygen make? Water. So we make metabolic water. Now, if you've ever studied dry fasting or anything, that's the idea there, right? When your body's burning fat, it's making water. But this isn't like craziness. This We've known this for a while. So this metabolic water is then part of our mitochondrial system because this metabolic water actually becomes the medium for the mitochondria, the battery, to hold an electrical charge. It's like you need to have fluid in a battery, right? Alkaline or things like that, right? There is a medium. So water can carry a charge. So without getting too complex, when we are burning fat, we are actually fueling the mitochondria in many ways with a structured form of water. This is extremely complex, but extremely cool. So what does this mean for you? What do you actually do? What are the takeaways? Well, the first most important thing how you structure fasting. You need to have periods of fasting and feasting, and you cannot fast without providing yourself enough nutrient quality and candidly enough calories. This is where people go wrong. If you just fast, you fast and fast and fast, you eventually end up in an energy depleted state. You're signaling and you're, you're, you're turning on all kinds of cool processes, but you're also eventually weakening yourself. So the big mistake that people make is they do not eat enough calories when they're not fasting. But the other mistake that people make is they weave their calories in too much, right? It's best to say, hey, I'm going to have a day where I am really fasting, and then I'm going to have a day where I'm really feasting. You see, it's not all about the food that you're taking in at one time affecting you an hour later. The food that you take in yesterday is affecting you today and it's affecting you tomorrow. As long as at the end of the week, net net, you're where you want your calories to be, maybe a slight deficit, maybe a slight surplus, maybe break even, that's the most important thing. I don't want you to overthink the calories anymore. I want you to provide your body with nutrient quality and nutrient density in a surplus and then have periods of time where you don't 
eat. But how can you maximize this mitochondrial biogenesis piece? How do you get more out of that? Well, step one, every day, don't eat between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. Okay, that's a quick way to sort of reset this system every day and improve that mitochondrial efficiency. Training in a little bit of a fasted state, this can make a very, very big difference. Why? Because you're stacking things that increase PGC1A. You're stacking things that increase mitochondrial biogenesis. So you're stacking the fasted element with the exercise element. Both things improve mitochondrial density. A sauna, obviously these are things I've talked about before, improve mitochondrial respiration, improve mitochondrial function. Okay, so you're improving that density. But why does this become important again? Because it's about restoring not just metabolic function, but energy at a core level within our body. You can see now how the mitochondria with their own specific DNA are really the conductors of the orchestra within our body. They're the ones that signal all the different changes to happen. One could even make the argument that it's as important as the brain. The mitochondria is like the brain that floats around throughout our body. So when you are in a deficient state or a dysfunctional state with the mitochondria, your body doesn't just not use fuel right. It's sending completely wrong signals and receiving wrong signals at a lower energy state. So stop overthinking calories too much and start giving credit to nutrient density. What are some of the things that you can add to the mix? Magnesium, because it increases membrane potential. It increases the ability for the protons to move through and create that charge. Okay, so high magnesium supplementation, 500 to 800 milligrams per day. Copper-rich foods help with the whole energy process as well. The B vitamins are one of the most important things you could imagine. They are critical for the redox stages. So essentially the actual electrons moving through the different stages of the mitochondria. If the electrons don't move through the mitochondria, then you can't ever get to the place where you create ATP in the first place. So B vitamins allow this to happen. So you have to get those B vitamins in, whether it's through supplement, good quality beef, maybe some beef liver. You can look at foods that are rich in B vitamins. I like bee pollen as well. It's a super good source. When you do eat saturated fats for membrane stability, you have to keep those membranes strong. It is extremely important. One of the things that we're also learning is that just electrolytes in general actually provide energy. It's not just about mineralization and muscle contraction. Why are we seeing changes in how energy moves in the mitochondria, even independent of calories? It's because electrolytes do actually cause changes at a mitochondrial level that allow voltage to change and create energy. They're batteries, not factories. And most importantly, independent of getting enough food when you're not fasting, protein, protein, protein. Part of the issue is protein degradation. Okay, When we have mitochondria that are dysfunctional, they have misfolding. The proteins are not folding. They're not going through these structural changes the way that they should. And that causes a protein breakdown. We need to supplement or get good amounts of protein in our diets, especially if we're fasting. Because when we fast, we break things down. But if we do not provide enough protein to repair, including damaged mitochondria, we set ourselves up for more failure in the future. So you'll never look at fasting the same way again. So with this, learning all these different things about how fasting is changing and the mitochondria is changing, you probably can't look at it the same way. But I did a video that breaks down the entire sort of quantum biology piece of this, which will flip everything you know about mitochondria on its head. I put that one right here. See you tomorrow.